Hey, I'm Richard Olsmuller. This is my book. I paid my $209,000 student loan debt in less than five years. We're having a little book reading tonight with my friends who have helped me achieve this monumental goal to pay off my student loans in less than five years. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna celebrate. I'm gonna read to you a little bit. This book is dedicated to free thinkers that listen to what people say, consider their worldview, and use what they learn to make decisions that help make them better versions of themselves. Acknowledgements. I'm thankful for my friends that reject the status quo and have the courage to try something different. I'm appreciative of the supportive teachers I had that helped me get acclimated to a trade that I knew nothing about. I am grateful for the hiring managers I had as a contractor and shortly thereafter as a company man who also rejected conventional wisdom and took a chance on me, an academic, to do a trades job with no trades experience. I wrote this book, you know, actually I, I knew all along that I wanted to write this book, uh, through the whole process that I was going through, and um, you know, as, as I was working these part-time jobs that I had, I was talking to my coworkers, and you know, I was telling some of the stories, uh, you know, of, uh, some experiences that I had in my life, and you know, after every one of those stories, you know, people were telling me, that's interesting, you know, or like, it's, they were uh, they really appreciated the story that I told them. So um, I just that was like another reason that you know I wanted to, to write the book because the people I tell my stories to really appreciated the stories. And you know I just again like I said it's a, you know a huge accomplishment and uh, you know I just want to share that with others. So uh, and here we go with my excerpt. This is uh, from Chapter Five, Michigan. I was living at my parents' house in Michigan and commuted to work at Long John Silver's about a half hour away. I like my lofty goals going into my restaurant career, but I let myself quickly lose sight of my goals. Just like in the Air Force, I became consumed by the daily drudgery and wasn't reminding myself daily or throughout the day what I was really trying to do. To cope with the misery I unwittingly put myself in, I drank a lot. I would get gallon jugs of cranberry juice and drink just enough cranberry juice out of the jug so I could mix in a 750 milliliter <laughs> bottle of vodka. I loved my vodka cranberry mix and I kept it on the floor of the passenger side of my car so I could drink it during my drive home after work. <laughs> I look forward to drinking it every night after I finish work. It was definitely the highlight of my night. I worked the closing shift and was off work between 10 and 11 p.m. Then, I drive away and start drinking my vodka cranberry mix. I had a good time doing it, and I was pretty drunk by the time I got back to my parents' house. My parents didn't notice. They were always asleep by the time I got home. Some nights, I bought gin and tonic water, pulled onto a side street to mix the gin into my tonic, just like I did my vodka cranberry mix, and drank that on my way home. I like, all, I like drinking 40s of Camel High Gravity Lager, and 30 packs of Miller High Life 2, but I waited to drink the beers at home because I thought the beer smell was too obvious and I knew I wouldn't get away with that if I was pulled over. I thought drinking my mixed drinks out of the tonic or juice containers was less obvious and didn't stink up my car as much as the beer. Although, one evening, I didn't have to work and I broke my no beer in the car rule. My father and I were drinking at the Moose Lodge, now a parking lot, one night. I was drinking mixed drinks, he was drinking cans of beer. After we finished drinking there, I was craving a smoke. So I dropped off my dad at our house. I only smoked clove cigarettes. The small town I lived in didn't have a smoke shop, so I had to drive a half hour to the next closest city that had a smoke shop, Battle Creek. I really didn't know where the smoke shop was in Battle Creek, I just knew how to get to the city. Before I left town on my road trip, I stopped at a quick service grocery store and picked up a couple each of Foster's Lager and Ale oil cans to drink along the way. It was a really nice summer evening, perfect weather. I had my music up and my car windows down as I drank a can of lager and then a can of ale along the winding road. I kept the full cans of beer and my empties in the brown paper sack behind my passenger seat. I stopped drinking once I was in city limits again. 
There wasn't much traffic on the four lane road in Battle Creek that evening, and I wasn't having much luck finding any open stores at all. As I was driving, I saw a gas station that was open. I really didn't think the gas station would have my clothes, but I was desperate. The gas station was on my right side, and I was cruising in the passenger lane two lanes away. I didn't want to pass the gas station and have to turn around, so I turned quickly from the passing lane and tried to pull into the parking lot. Before I even made it into the driveway of the parking lot, I hit the car that was driving in my blind spot. The good thing was, I achieved my goal, and I ended up in the gas station parking lot before passing it. The bad thing was, I dented both of our cars in the process. The accident wasn't that big of a deal, nobody was injured, but the lady driving the car was hysterical because she said she just got a car back out of the shop from doing the same thing a couple weeks earlier. As the sun was setting, some guy walking by saw me drive into her car and told the lady he called the police. I was pretty drunk, so I knew this wasn't going to be good for me. I walked into the gas station convenience store looking for some emergency provisions. I bought some Little Trees Royal Pine Car Fresheners, Spearmint Gum, and a pack of Newport 100s in a box. No, they didn't have the clove cigarettes I was looking for, and that didn't bother me too much because I had much bigger problems in my mind. I quickly hung an air freshener on my rear view window, and I put the other two air fresheners on the shirt hooks in my back seat only after rubbing one of the air fresheners on my forearms and legs so I wouldn't reek so bad of booze. I knew I had to get rid of my empty cans of beer, and anybody who saw me throw anything into the garbage would have immediately checked the trash can, so that wasn't a good idea. I was in luck. I had a bifold back seat, so I quickly and discreetly pulled the right half of the back seat down while simultaneously grabbing my sack of empty and full beers, shoving it into my trunk and closing the seat back again. Then I got out of my car, stood in front of the gas station, and started chain smoking. I smoked three or four of those Newports within a few minutes. I don't know if it was the nicotine or my extreme nervousness, but all of a sudden, I had an almost uncontrollable urge to defecate. I walked back into the convenience store and asked the gas station clerk for the bathroom key. He handed me a foot-long wooden dowel with the key hanging from the stick by a formerly white but now gray piece of string. I grabbed the key with my thumb and index finger, walked outside and around to the side of the building and opened the door to the restroom. It really wasn't in that bad a condition. Gang insignias and obscenities were carved into the mirror in typical public restroom fashion, and there were a couple crumpled paper towels on the gray painted concrete floor, but it was generally well kept. I lined the toilet seat with a few layers of toilet paper as I normally do and had a seat and proceeded to have the biggest bowel movement of my life. I wasn't in there too long, but I was expecting to see the police officer already talking to the lady by the time I got out of there. And I was thinking that was going to make me look bad. When I walked out of the restroom and into the parking lot, I was pleasantly surprised to see the police had not yet arrived. And I started to feel like I was winning. As I was returning to the bathroom key, to the gas station attendant, I looked over at the lady whose car I hit, and she was nervously sitting in her car. She hadn't left her car since we pulled into that gas station parking lot, so I walked over and began talking to her. She told me the guy who said he had called the police really didn't call the police. Seeing this as something in my favor, I tried to negotiate a deal with the lady. I told her I would make monthly payments to her so she could fix her car. Somehow, she did not believe me that I would follow through, and she wanted the police report for insurance. So, she called the police, and within a few minutes, a police officer arrived. I was still standing in the parking lot, but by this time, I was chewing gum. The police officer spoke with the frantic lady first. When he was finished listening to her side of the story, he walked over to me. He was a tall, slender man about my age. He took my driver's license and told me his understanding of what happened. I agreed with him and repeated to him what he told me. I think he appreciated that I was calm. He confiscated my driver's license, wrote me a ticket, and that was it. No breathalyzer, no long drawn out affair, just a ticket, and I was on my way. I asked him what I should do if I get pulled over on my way home, and he said all I needed to do was show the police officer my citation, and I'd be good. I thanked him, got in my car, buckled up, and drove away. I chose that excerpt to read to you because um, 
you know, really, of all the crimes that I committed, this is the only one that I got away with. <laughs> and I'm really kind of... It fills me with some... I don't know. I just feel really good about it. That, um, And I probably shouldn't feel good about getting away with something that I did wrong, but it doesn't matter. I, I chose it to you. I enjoy it, and I hope you too as well enjoy it. And yeah. So anyway, uh, that's why I wrote the excerpt. And here's what I hope for you as the readers. I hope that you, first of all, are entertained by the book. And in the process of being entertained, I hope that you can also learn a little something about, who knows, I talk about so much stuff in this book other than just paying my student loans off. Um, you're bound to learn something. Maybe you'll learn an artist that you had not heard of before, and I'll introduce it to you and you say like, wow, I really appreciate their work, and I'm gonna start listening to more of their music. Um, it could be as simple as that, and maybe it'll be something more profound. In any case, I hope, again, thank you for coming, and I hope to uh, continue to entertain and educate you.